Welcome back, everyone. For the next fireside chat, which is on Alaska's role in energy, economic, and national security, I'm so delighted to introduce our friend, our colleague, Christy Bell, who is Associate Vice Chancellor of the Business Enterprise Institute at the University of Alaska, Anchorage. Christy, over to you to moderate your panel and introduce your panelists. Thank you, and thank you, Jennifer. I, I really, I think we all need to applaud the Atlantic Council as well as Idaho National Laboratory, but in particular, Jennifer just has gone above and beyond, and we would not have been able to do this without, without both, so thank you. And um, I also want to just give a little bit of my background. I have had the privilege of working with Idaho National Laboratory as one of their uh, emerging energy market analysis uh, inaugural members and have um, originally kind of went into that role kicking and screaming and was like, but I'm an economic development practitioner. What will I bring to the table? And what I've learned uh, through this process over the last few years is, yes, that technology is important, but what we do with that technology where the opportunities are for us as a state to build a stronger economy, for us as a nation to use, uh, you know, we've heard it throughout the morning, to be able to, you know, build out a new supply chain and to become more uh, resilient as a nation, as states, as Western states. So that's a lot of the, the conversation we're going to have here this afternoon. And it's my honor to be able to be on the same stage as our Lieutenant Governor Nancy Dahlstrom with Mike Spraga, who's the Chair and Distinguished Fellow of the Wilson Center Polar Institute, and then Jess Jeans, who is the Associate Lab Director for Idaho National Laboratory. And uh, I really am so honored to be able to be up here with each of you. So we are going to jump in, and I, you know, as I mentioned, it's this whole um, almost Venn diagram of how the Arctic economic development and this national security element kind of intertwine and how, um, where we'll be, in, you know, a year from now. So, Lieutenant Governor Dahlstrom, we've heard a lot this morning about what energy security and economic security mean for Alaska. What makes Alaska unique in thinking through its energy policies and why has Alaska taken an interest in advanced nuclear? Those are good questions, Christy. I think that Alaska is unique. In fact, I know Alaska is unique in so many ways. Um, we have different cultures. We have uh, lots of different terrain. We have very remote villages where a lot of people live. We have temperatures that are unique to much of the United States. And so we, we have to you know, make our business decisions, but we also have to deal with the, the facts that Mother you know, Earth has, has dealt to us. So, you know, these vast remote areas that we have, it can be a little bit different getting a project going in an area that, you know, that doesn't have a big population base um, around it. But that being said, we still are moving forward. We want to develop. We want to uh, increase um, the use of all of the energy items that are out there, and I'm going to throw out, you know, renewables, green energy, all of those things, oil and gas, but we do have an opportunity for nuclear, and we do um, have a big interest in that. You know, one of the things about Alaska that's so unique is some of our villages in different places, it can take a long time to get there. And so maybe if we had a village where you have to fly to a certain place, and then you have to take a boat or a barge, and then a snow machine to tow your goods in, you know, people, when they leave, they don't just come back that same day. So if we, um, you know, if we had an opportunity to have, you know, a box type setup of a nuclear um, system that could be, I'm going to say, use the word delivered, and I use that lightly because it could be, it, it could have to go on all those modes of transportation and take much longer than just a couple days. But once we got it there, and got it up and going, we have a village or even several vi villages that connect that could um, have the benefit of having that energy right there. And they don't have to be staffed 24 seven like so many of our other um, utilities do. You have to, you know, if it's water or sewer, um, 
you've got to have somebody there 24 seven. And when it doesn't happen, or people don't understand the necessity of it, and things freeze up or shut down, it's very, very costly to fix them. But also sometimes it's almost impossible in Alaska because of weather related situations. And so, you know, that, that brings us a bunch of other challenges. But I think you will, uh, the more you learn about Alaska, the more you'll find that we are interested in nuclear. In fact, Governor Dunleavy is extremely supportive. In uh, 2022, he introduced um, legislation that allowed for um, small uh, nuclear reactors to be in Alaska, and it passed handily. And I know we have, um, we have Senator Giesel here today. I don't know, if, do we have any other elected reps from senators? People are just I, like- I think they're watching online. They're all we watching have quite online. A few. We have a lot of people that are very, very interested. And I love the fact that they want to think outside of the box. What have we been doing? What's worked well, but what haven't we tried? And, and then why haven't we tried it? And let's you know unpeel the layers and see what we can do to bring security um, and energy security to Alaskans. That'll also help industry and other businesses and things to come in. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I really, that's, for me, working in economic development, I'll, I'll, you know, every day, that is just such the link to yep. our resiliency. So, um, Mike, I'm gonna pivot it just a little bit, um, and you have tremendous experience in the Arctic, but I'm, I'm curious how you conceptualize and kind of explain the Arctic and Alaska's kind of role it, part of the Arctic and, and that connection to the rest of the nation. Yeah, that's a, that's a scale up. Thank, Christy, yeah. <laughs> thank you for having me and, and thanks to INL and Atlantic Council for, for bringing these discussions to, to our state. Uh, as an Alaskan, I have a different perspective perhaps. Um, I, I think our state is at the nexus between domestic and foreign policy. It, 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 you, you just can't escape the map. You can't escape the geography. So whether we're talking about energy security or national security or homeland security, or you pick your favorite security, um, Alaska for the nation is, is at that nexus. Um, I think what you're alluding to is, is I've tried to explain our state, but also what I think are the key drivers that are changing the Arctic and why people should care about the Arctic, the North, Alaska. And I think every one of them has a crosswalk. There are, to me, there are these seven key drivers, literally, figuratively, politically, changing the contours of the North. And I've heard a number of those themes played out this morning, so maybe I'll just riff that a little bit and then one other comment and I'll, I'll wrap it. But to me, the, the seven key drivers We've heard them already this morning, the climate, I mean, the, the, right, the, the globe is changing. The Arctic four, as much as four times faster than the rest of the world, change, changing and warming, and we see the implications of that. Uh, commodities, we've talked about critical minerals, but also you can keep, keep that portfolio of issues across the commodity spectrum. Commerce, we heard about shipping lanes and trade, and we often think of trade north-south sometimes when we're up here in the north, but we should be thinking east-west. We should be thinking Alaska, Canada, Greenland, Iceland, and all of our colleagues along that arc of the Arctic, uh, which is an arc of cooperation in Mike's mind. Uh, the connectivity, not just internet, but how are we connected? Roads, uh, ports, and maybe we can revisit the port issue when we're talking about some hard security mm -hmm. world, but thinking about the connectivity, if you wanna have a mine someplace or develop an energy, uh, asset, you, you're going to have to build roads, energy, on and on and on. So, so interconnectivity is, is, a, is a major issue. Uh, our communities, we've heard there's major challenges in Arctic and especially Alaska communities. They're just economic development, e economic feasibility, economic sustainability, and also a lot of opportunity, lots of opportunities. Uh, another one would be just cooperation in the North. Uh, there's a lot of cooperation in the North, even today, among like-minded nations. Uh, which has helped us the last 25 years or so and will hopefully help us into the future. And I think the last one is this, you know, the geopolitics, the competition of the North, and we've seen that elevate in the last several years, especially over the last two and a half years, but that has been brewing for a number of years now. All of that plays into the very issue I think we're talking about, which is energy security and the ripples from, from all of that, because without energy security, the rest of the securities suffer. My final point would be on that, on that point would be, um, I don't know how you get to energy security or any of, any of the securities, water, food, community security, without research security. And not, mm. not IP, not, mm. not that kind of, but yes, mindful of the, the IP equation. But unless we're funding 
through research to the degree that it can respond to the needs of our time. Uh, to me, that's, that's a real security issue. Are we funding the right research in the right places to you know, meet the aspirations and the, the real needs that we have, not just as an Arctic community, but as a global community and as an American? Do we have the right research in place and is it funded in the way in which we need to fund it? Excellent, and, uh, and to kind of... Can I, can I definitely, throw something in yes, on that? Yes. So, you know what, we in Alaska feel so lucky and blessed that Mike is in the position that he's in because he does know Alaska so well. But you know, we're talking about Arctic. There's only one reason that the United States is an Arctic nation, and that's because of Alaska. Without us, we are not an Arctic nation. And it's extremely important that people recognize that and that they include Alaska in the discussions and debates, as you mentioned, that happen many times. In, they start in D.C. and sometimes they end in D.C. And then we are given notification of this is what's happening or here's your money and now you get to study you know, ABC. We know what needs to be studied. We know what's changing here. We want to work hand in hand with Washington, D.C. and everyone that's involved in this. But uh, I think it's e been easy for some people to forget or maybe they never even really knew that without Alaska, we are not an Arctic nation and we need to be considered. Um, in fact, w you know, we're, we're taking, we're getting a little bit more hard headed about it and I in a meeting said to the ambassador, um, I insist that you in include us in these things, otherwise things are not going to go smoothly. So um, I don't usually talk like that to people. <laughs> Those in this room that know me know that, but it's, we feel very strongly about it. Yeah, and, and just to kind of, you know, I'll use the word riff off both of your, your comments, I just, uh, our global position so well yes. positions us to not only learn and, and build the economics here in state, but then commercialize globally. I, I just, that part gets me giddy. But we wouldn't be here without frontiers. So let me run back to, to Jess. Um, you've done so much leadership in, in, through INL to um, both help get microreactors to the marketplace and to create this important dialogue, um, and, but to also bring important partners together. I, I think of my partners in you know, Wyoming, Idaho now as close friends, and they're really advancing some of our thinking. So right. um, can you share with us a little bit about Um, and thank you very much for having me. And, and I didn't pay Mike here to talk about research. Uh, really. <laughs> so we are a national, one of the 17 A cup of coffee will do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So maybe it is. A, 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 yeah. But uh, we are one of 17 national, D Department of Energy National Laboratories. Our, our laboratory is focused on nuclear energy, which is probably isn't surprising to anyone. Uh, but that's our, our main objective. We do research, a lot of research and development. You know, great sponsorship from the from the office, the Nuclear Energy Mike office over there, and talked earlier. Uh, we have a lot of uh, scientific, engineering, research capabilities on our, our site. I call it a large site, except I'm in Alaska, so that maybe uh, doesn't carry the weight it does in, in most states. But it doesn't. yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it's still pretty li for a, for a, a national laboratory. If you can hear me, I'll try to try to speak up. But, uh, okay, I think it's back. Okay, we'll have a backup plan. We're, we're engineers here, so we'll have a backup plan. Um, but we have a lot of infrastructure that we use uh, for nuclear energy research, and we've been uh, researching uh, nuclear technology for now, actually next year, 75 years on our site. We've had 52 reactors, so uh, there's a lot of experience gained. If you look at the current you know, micro-reactor development, a lot of that technology was developed in the national laboratories, particularly uh, Idaho National Laboratory, the fuels, the materials, um, you know, modeling, simulation, all those aspects of technology, research and development, early stage research and development, bring it up to a maturity point at which we can work with partners, and there are many of them here on the industry side, to say, okay, that technology can be commercialized and meet some of the needs that we heard from, from you all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, one, one phase is R&D, the next phase is uh, commercialization. Okay, I'll just go with this one. Um, commercialization, so we're working with many companies. 
Uh, and then, you know, the third area, you know, really when you look at frontiers, uh, we look at, I, at INL as, as while well, it's, its name has Idaho in it, as a regional resource, uh, including Alaska, though it's a little bit of a hop to get here. Uh, there are a lot of commonalities with this region that, that everybody's talked about, you know, rural needs for remote power, um, you know, uh, I would say state governments that are very open to uh, to nuclear energy and what it offers, and then the opportunities, real opportunities in a new energy environment that a clean energy source uh, like nuclear offers. Thanks, Jess, and I've learned to think of uh, INL or Idaho National Laboratory as Alaska's National Laboratory, so I appreciate the, the way that leadership has really positioned that. Um, so I'm going to come back to you, Lieutenant Governor. Great. Uh, tell us a little bit about the economic security from an Alaska context. We okay. heard a little bit from Mike from kind of a global context and, um, and the role of energy and economic development. Well, you touched a little bit about the importance of economic development and, you know, if you don't have certain things, you just can't function. I mean, if you don't have public safety, if you don't have jobs, if you don't have, you know, a a certain level of health care, all these basic types of things, you can't, people can't function and then they also can't continue to develop um, things. So the energy sector is important to us in, in bringing jobs to Alaska and we know that there will be many new jobs that come, but also we are, we're working our darndest to do what we can to bring the cost of energy down for Alaskans. Um, there, the governor has an uh, energy um, task force that he's asked me to chair. Um, in fact, one of our one of our co-chairs is here today. Clay from Cordova is here, and you, I don't know if you have if you haven't met him. He's a great resource to talk to about Alaska. Um, and we do have a meeting this afternoon, but don't don't slough from here and go over there. But um, you know, the governor has tasked us with coming up with ten cent a minute. Uh, kilowatt power and that's going to be a big a big lift for us but we know we can do that in some parts of the state we may not be able to do it in all parts of the state but but that's our goal and that's what we're working for we are going to present the governor when this task force is completed with um, a report that has several options for him and ways that statewide we can improve this um, and of course, we're going to try to, when the cost of energy is down, people can invest the money in other things. So everything continues to grow. Companies can hire more people. Um, you know, the better the, the positions, um, the quality of folks that, that you get in your communities, then they give back. It's just kind of a cyclical thing. But, you know, if you didn't know, we get some really cold weather here. So um, energy is, is vital to us surviving, too. Yeah, yeah, both the heat and, and the, yeah, completely. Um, and thank you for your leadership on that task force. Oh, thank I, you. I know a report's coming out soon. It, I believe, Clay, we changed the due date. We got a little extension, and I believe it's November. 17th? Well, it was the 17th. We extended it to the 31st. Oh, nice. Yes. Nice. Well, I look forward to digging into it. And I've heard that there's wonderful recommendations throughout there's it. There's some so. really fantastic. The, the group has 15 members, um, and then we broke it up into subgroups, and they've been having their um, meetings, which have all been noticed so people could participate. Um, of course, we followed uh, all of our legal requirements mm -hmm. of noticing things. We're very conscientious about that. But it's it's been a wonderful opportunity for people statewide to participate and you know there's some people that have said this is a this is a challenge you guys are not going to be able to do and others have said oh this is a piece of cake and I don't think it's either one of those things it's in the middle um, and we will we will give the governor a report that I believe he'll be pleased with and that um, I think the legislature will be pleased with it also okay all right I'm gonna keep us moving only because I'm getting a nod that uh, got a lot to get through still. So Mike, you recently wrote a report called Navigating, not a breakup, but breakup. Uh, <laughs> security realities of freezing politics and thawing landscapes in the Arctic. 
What does the changing landscape of the Arctic mean for geopolitical competition? And you know, where are you, where are you thinking that we stand? Yeah. So I wrote that with several colleagues from uh, from uh, uh, Norwegian colleagues. It was a read-in for a, a meeting we did with the Munich Security Conference, and it's about a, a year or so old. But the dynamics have only you know, they've changed, not for the good. Mm -hmm. The dynamics are, are far different now. So just a couple of weeks ago, we had a joint Sino-Russian naval armada off the coast of Alaska, which means off the coast of a NATO country. Mm. Just. Just think on that for a moment. Um, we see far more Russian build out of their, of their military. Uh, we see uh, China having far more activity, far more interests in the North. And then we see Russia and China together uh, operating in the North. Uh, this has changed an equation quite rapidly. So that report written, to, written right after um, and released right after the uh, invasion, reinvasion of, of Ukraine. Uh, elevated the issue, but unfortunately it has been magnified now. Um, if you think about, I hope this is tracking the, the, the question, yeah. but if you think yeah, about yeah. the, the change here, w which is why you see far more activity, NATO, uh, our, our bilateral relationship with Canada, the North American Arctic, I mean this stretches all the way from, from Alaska through, through, this, through, through the North American Arctic, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Uh, the North Atlantic, the North Pacific, all of these things are tied together and we're seeing them being tied together along with this, this joint uh, efforts between Russia and China, not just economic development, buying oil, shipping it down maybe in single hull <coughs> all the way to Chinese markets along our Bering Strait, our Sherry Bering Strait. That should set off alarms uh, just in the geopolitical realm. Uh, but if you think about the key player here is Russia and China in that relationship, Russia holds keys natural resources development and of course needs resources. China needs oil, gas, other assets, and they have the cash to build out complexes that the Russians would like to see built out. If you play that, just fast forward, that's just happening globally. If, and and what, what is of concern is that the fundamental shift here that's happened uh, over time, over the last four decades or so. But if you think back to Deng Xiaoping, and his sort of dictate on foreign policy. That, that there were three basic themes to that. One was his China was uh, never show your strength, never show your strength, bide your time, and never lead. Those are the three. Now that's for external audiences. Fast forward to Xi Jinping's China. That's 180 degrees from what we see today. And don't think it's just happening in Africa or the Middle East where it is happening or elsewhere. It's happening in our Arctic. Right? They are not hiding their strength, they are not biding their time, and they are not not leading. So for me, geopolitically, the Arctic now, not just because the sea ice has shrunk and opened up shipping lanes, it's become a space where China would like to have more influence and where Russia is a willing partner in that. That is part of a very new dynamic. Not that it wasn't there before, but now it's a sense of urgency for our nation, for our NATO and ally partners. And, and I can talk later about sort of there's different streams of how we might, might think about the rest of the globe in terms of, of the big geopolitics. But again, that plays into energy because energy is a key driver of that relationship along with China's interest in influencing the dialogue around, around the Arctic. And remember, the Arctic states should dominate, should lead, should be the conclusive uh, dictators of what happens in the Arctic. They should, Arctic nations should govern the Arctic. Right, I want to pull the string on that a little bit more, Justin. We talked about all these opportunities for Alaska, but how will developing microreactors for primary off-grid use enable greater economic security or even national security or address those priorities? Good, good point. I'll use this. Um, yeah, you know the the uh, the great thing about nuclear is that it it you know we heard some of the attributes earlier, energy dense. It also can operate for a long time, provide a lot of power for a long time without you know, constant refueling. And so I like the term deliver. You can deliver these systems to remote locations because they're fairly compact and run them for years without having to refuel. And they, you know, they operate reliably. If you look at our commercial nuclear fleet above 90% capacity factor, these microreactors I think are being developed to even be more reliable. Uh, and so 24 seven reliable power deliverable remotely provides, you know, heat and power, many applications with 
require both heat and power, particularly in the Arctic. Uh, that's also where, where nuclear energy shines. And then, you know, it's a domestic source of energy. Um, you know, we, these are being developed by U.S. companies, so we have a, we'll be developing a supply chain that you've heard, heard about as well. So, uh, so, you know, homegrown energy sources. Uh, broader, in a broader picture, then, it also, you look at the global, global situation as we deploy these at home, there's going to be interest in, in deploying these globally where we also would compete with Russia and China and in establishing long-term relationships by, by uh, helping all of our allies and friends with their power needs as well. Excellent. We are just about out of time, and I wish I had the whole afternoon, actually, to hang out with you three. Um, and I encourage others to ask questions, but quickly, give me like those of us that are continuing in this work with Frontiers as we partner with our Western states from your, you know, different positions. What should we continue to keep doing over this next year? Well, I think it's important that we keep collaborating together. And I think that we will probably see in Alaska the legislature have hearings and educational um, type seminars and things that will be led by a handful of those that are really aware of the benefits for Alaska. Um, I think that we need to look at um, what we can do for our very remote areas in our state. Um, we have, I mean, if you just look at Bethel as one place, for example, there's 56 villages that feed into that. And if all of those could have some sort of a nuclear, you know, Solution. reactor there yeah. and a solution, that's a better word. Um, I just see so many possibilities. Yeah, they're pretty endless. But we need to, con <laughs> we just need to continue working together and talking about the things that might seem impossible or they seemed impossible yesterday, but you know, we, if we keep, I mean, this group, you, all the experts that are here, we can make things happen. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, so I, I, I think that's right. I think we need to keep moving forward and discussing the opportunities that, you know, you talked about it, value add of having energy and, and heat, uh, you know, to, to uh, again, if you look at products produced, the que you know, question came up earlier, what additional value add could be done within Alaska to, to increase the, uh, you know, the revenues from, from products produced here. The second thing is, is more, maybe a little bit more on us and the developers is moving forward and getting these reactors demonstrated so they're available if we had them today, I think you know we'd be signing up, signing up people all over the place. But we need to make them real, and so that's something we are really focused on. Good point. I have more questions on that, but we'll make certain Mike has a moment. I, I think meetings like this, mm -hmm. just having more discussions like this. Thanks, INL and Atlanta Council for coming to the state, and more partnerships like this. Uh, we we have expertise here. We have incredible opportunity here, but we need the partnership. Yep. Yep, yep. And I encourage all of you to network with each other. We've tried the best we can to curate an audience of both micro reactor nuclear experts, vendors in the field, as well as, you know, uh, academia, government, uh, NGO types to really make certain that we have that mix that's necessary. We call it in the economic development world the quad helix because that's what's essential to bring those players together to build a stronger economy and that's what this is about. So thank you all. I truly wish we had more time. Yep, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.